Well, it's a great day in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Welcome to Living Supernaturally. Yours truly, David Martin. And uh, hey, we got a great program for you today on the basis of great faith. <laughs> I say this about so many different uh, uh, messages that God gives me, and I say, you know, this is absolutely one of the best. But <laughs> although that's true, this is one of the best, and it's so full of revelation and understanding in walking in the supernatural. You know, my heart is to help you to understand how to walk in the supernatural. Specifically, the mission that God gave me way back 40-some years ago was to understand the, the truth of the reality that Jesus said, he who believes in me will do what I do and even greater. And, all, and so many messages that God gives me in my 40 years of studying this help us to uh, understand you know, the principles, precepts, concepts, if you will, of how to do what Jesus did. But this one miracle, I, I think, uh, lays it out better than probably any other because it has so much significant truth in it. And uh, uh, we are... We changed last week from a one-hour format to a 30-minute format, and I want to thank those of you that uh, commented, not many comments online, we didn't have, I think, one comment, uh, and I want to thank you for that, but others have uh, sent me emails or text and said as well they liked the 30-minute format. Uh, we're going to stick with it, and I, I must tell you, it is a challenge for me to do this, but uh, bottom line, we're, we're going to uh, make it happen, and uh, we believe in miracles, so therefore we know it can happen, and it did happen last week. So, But we're going to dig right into this, but let me make a quick announcement to you. I'm doing an interview, at least we're planning an, an interview later today for next week's program uh, with uh, John Tussey. John Tussey is a musician that was mentored by David Vancouver, a quantum physicist that I had a chance to uh, spend some time with personally. But uh, David Vancouver died, went to heaven, and he's, he's an uh, incredible musician, but, but really a scientist more than anything, a quantum physicist. But he d invented a, uh, a synthesizer, I mean, it has 600 different inventions, uh, patents, I guess I would say. But he invented a synthesizer that created the sounds of heaven. When he was in heaven, he recognized sounds were different. And what he recognized, because all of creation has a voice, the stones, the ro I mean, everything has a voice, the plants. But every what he discovered is every element has a frequency. The atomic table, I think it's 103 elements, I think it's 103, maybe it's 108. Of course, they have more now because they've uh, modified some. But basically, 100 and 308 elements uh, in the periodic table, everyone has its own frequency. And uh, again, David Vancouvering uh, designed an instrument to play the sounds of the elements. People that have died, went to heaven, have said, this is what, what it sounds like. This is what music sounds like in heaven. And before David Vancouver died, and I think two years ago now, I'm not quite sure exactly when he died, but before he died, he mentored John Tussey, the only person in the world he mentored in how to create this music. And I uh, spent about an hour on the phone last week with John, and, and uh, our plan is to do an interview this week, and hopefully today yet, He's currently in Alaska. He lives in Hawaii. But uh, the plan is we're going to have him next week. And when I have an outside guest like this come in, we will do a full one-hour uh, program. So that's the plan for next Tuesday night. And uh, so let's jump into this week's plan. Also, if you're in the uh, Milwaukee area, I'm going to be in Milwaukee this Friday night and Saturday morning at the Crimson Way Church. And then next week, and this coming week, Sunday, we're going to be uh, in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Very rarely do I do much ministry here in the Broken Arrow area, uh, but we are going to be ministering here in Broken Arrow. And uh, that's going to be next Sunday, 2 o'clock and 7 o'clock. All the information is on the website. 
All right, basis of great faith, here we come. Now, I'm going to highlight a couple of points, I, 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 just highlights if we will, of the, uh, the healing of the centurion's servant. And uh, I, we touched on this last week, but just as a quick introduction again, a uh, couple of reasons why this story is, is really unique. One is only twice in the, in the scriptures do we identify, or do we see Jesus identifying, I should say, people to having great faith. And again, that's what we're looking at here, is the basis of great faith. Well, both times he identified people to having great faith, they use their faith for somebody else. The other key factor is they're not religious people, they're not Jewish people, they're Gentiles. And uh, so both times people use their faith mm -hmm. for somebody else and then somebody else is going to receive a miracle at a distance away. Really, I mean, some profound concepts there. Number two, key thing, is only twice in the life of Jesus, as recorded in Scripture, does he marvel. He marvels once here in this story uh, that we're going to look at today in Luke chapter 7 and then the parallel, parallel account in Matthew chapter 8. Uh, but in all the Scriptures in totality, we only see Jesus marveling. Greek words, the mazo, it appears, as I recall, like 44 times in Scripture. It means to marvel, to be amazed, to be astonished, to admire. And, uh, and everyone marvels at Jesus. But he himself only is credited in Scripture with marveling twice. And here's what's interesting. Is he marvels once because of great faith. Because of great faith, again, someone else is going to get a miracle at distance away. The only other time he's going to marvel is when he comes to his own hometown in uh, Mark 6. There he marvels because of no faith. And because of no faith, Jesus himself, it says, could do no mighty works, no dunamis, no miracles. So, uh, so those are two real significant uh, key elements. Now, a couple more significant points is the centurion recognized that Jesus himself was not a healer. And it sounds sacrilegi sacrilegious. <laughs> we touched on that a little bit last week. But the reality is Jesus was not a healer any more than I'm not a healer. And it's really important to know that because when you when you recognize that, then you're going to understand how you're going to do what he did and even greater. And then we're going to take a whole lesson and dig into that. And one lesson, again, we touched on it last week a little bit, but the key factor here is God was working through Jesus. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. And the same Holy Spirit that anointed Jesus is the same Holy Spirit that anoints us when we are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And that is a key reason why we can do what he did and even greater. Next key point is that he understood the power of the spoken word and uh, that Jesus didn't need to come and, and as it would be lay hands on the servant. All he had to do is speak the word in mind. Again, that's another whole lesson itself. Uh, he also understood and this is just a real uh, significant lesson here, the, the, the uh, uh, de idea, the concept of delegated authority. Now, what happens here in this story, and again, we're going to look at this as we look at the two different accounts in what appears to be a contradiction in how Jesus, uh, or I should say the centurion, delegated authority to two different groups of people representing his name. And this is so powerful because that's exactly what Jesus did for you and I and why there is such great power in the name and that at the name of Jesus, every name named, heaven, earth, and under the earth, has to bow its knee. And finally, key point that we're going to dig in today a little bit, and that is, uh, one, no, sorry, <laughs> One, one thought ahead of myself here. <laughs> Next point is faith works by love. Uh, we'll touch on this a little bit, but the reality is the, the centurion was willing to lay down his life for his servant. And, and, and literally the word there in, uh, in one instance anyway is the word doulos, which means slave, bond slave. But what we're going to look at today is uh, another concept, and that is faith comes by hearing. Again, we're looking at the reality that this guy, the centurion, uh, has great faith. 
So it's more than just faith, it's great faith. And we'll look at this another time, but there's different uh, aspects of faith, the saving faith and the mountain moving faith, and here, great faith. But uh, today, what I want to do is, uh, first one, I want to read the whole story. We didn't do that last week. And uh, we're going to read it from Luke's account today. Uh, when we get to Matthew's account again, we're going to see an apparent contradiction. But again, there's no contradiction in the word. It just appears to be a contradiction because in Luke, we're going to see two different groups of people that are sent. But when we read Matthew's account, these two groups aren't mentioned. Matthew says the centurion came personally. And, and when we get to that lesson, we're going to look at, again, delegated authority. We'll also understand another kind of a mystery, and that is why two different groups of people were sent. But today we're going to look at another kind of, a, not really a mystery, but kind of interesting uh, thing here. But let's read the story first. Starting in, in Luke 7, and I'm reading from New American Standard Bible. It says, when he had completed all of his discourse and the hearing of the people, that's being Jesus, he went to Capernaum. Uh, and, he said, and so Capernaum, it's important to remember Capernaum. We get into this probably more next week or next time we get together anyway. But uh, this miracle is going to happen in Capernaum. And it says, and a certain, so I'm quoting King James here, King James so often, uh, Back to New American, New American Standard. And a centurion slave who was highly regarded by him was sick and about to die. It's another, uh, uh, I keep using the word key, but a significant little piece of text here. He was about to die. That means he was ready to die. He was at the point of death, or what we would say today, he's on his deathbed. Now, here's our key word for today. When he heard about Jesus. And again, how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing. And uh, literally, I, I've not studied this out myself, but I've heard it taught that the, in, the, in the tense of the Greek there, it means hearing and hearing and hearing, repeated hearing. It's a continuing verb. But what's interesting is we look at that. Uh, let me go back up here. Um, and I'm going to note here on this uh, faith comes by hearing, and that, that uh, is a quote or from Romans ten seventeen, from New American Standard. It says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Now, when we look at this, we're going to see, uh, it's, look, let me give it to you from the Amplified Bible. It says, so faith comes by hearing, and then what it has in brackets is, what is Told. So someone is telling a story, and this is this is a key factor here of uh, the centurion's miracle, because it says again when he heard of Jesus. So what he heard was being told, and then again again this is going back to Romans ten and seventeen and amplified it again says so faith comes by hearing what is told, and what is heard comes from, comes by the preaching of the message that came from the lips of Christ, the Messiah himself. Now, uh, that kind of expanded definition, again, going back to the original New American Standard, is faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. And where we get that expanded understanding is recognizing that, that the word, word, in hearing by the word of Christ, that word, word, in the Greek is the word rhema. And that word, its basic definition means spoken. So and it's not just spoken, it's, it, it's the anointed word, it's the spoken word of Jesus, or the word of God. You know, all, you know, we have the red letters that's spoken by Christ, but the entire Bible is the word of God, amen? So it's the word became flesh. So the entire Bible, when it is, any word from the Bible, when it's spoken, it is considered a rhema word. And the idea, though, is more than just spoken, it's revelatory. And that's when it really becomes rhema to you. It's, you've heard it directly from the Word of God in your, hear, in your hearing, in your ears, 
but it, it comes with a revelation. That's real rhema. And as we look at this story, we're going to see that this rhema is going to come probably from the centurion's neighbor, which is a nobleman, and his son has an identical problem. His son, the nobleman, uh, or the royal, uh, the royal person, the person of royalty, he has a son that's at the point of death. And he is going to get healed as well, and he is going to get healed by the spoken word. Now, we'll come back to that in just a minute, but giving a little background here to help you to understand, this is such an incredible story. So again, it says, when he, verse 3, when he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders, this is group number one, asking him to come and save the life of his slave. Now, another you know, uh, interesting fact or uh, element in the story is we have three different Greek words in this story, in the original text of the Greek, in, in Luke and Matthew's account, three different Greek words that are all translated, in King James anyway, into the word heal, or healed, or healing. But it's three different Greek words, and each word has a, obviously a, a little different meaning. Now this here, where it's translated that he wanted the elders to come and heal his slave, that is the word diasozo. We looked at that a little bit last week. And again, King James would say uh, heal. Here it's save, but dia literally is the word, uh, th- means through or channel. And, and then sozo is where we get saved from, but it's also where we get the word healed from. The woman with the issue of blood, if I touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. Uh, Jairus, come pray for my daughter that she will be healed. Again, it's the word sozo. So let's continue on. When they came, the last the elders of the Jews, they earnestly imploring him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and he has built us a synagogue. Now, see, this is religious thinking at its best. Now, again, these are the elders of the Jews. And uh, the, the, a religious mindset says you're worthy for healing or miracles or, or benefiting from God's grace because of works. We know different than that because the Bible says by grace you're saved uh, through faith. It's a gift of God, not works. But the, again, the religious mindset, the elders of the Jews, is saying that Jesus, he's worthy, and the reason he's worthy is he loves, now that word love is the Greek word agapeo, it's the verb form of agape, but he loves our nation, that's faith, or love I should say, in motion. And how was that love demonstrated? He built us a synagogue. And so they're equating works to reason of worth. Of course, that's not true, uh, and that's not why Jesus is going to come. But nonetheless, that's just the religious mindset. So again, they say he is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. Now Jesus started on his way with them, again, elders of the Jews, and he was not far from the house, and the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. See, now we see something had to happen. This is kind of the mystery we'll dig into in another lesson. But what happened that's not here between verse 3 and verse 6 that caused him to have a change of heart or change of mind where he says to the elders, come and be sozo. But then while Jesus is en route, something happened and he said, uh, don't bother coming, just speak the word and my servant will be healed. Uh, now, again, there's another Greek word for healing, and that is the Greek word iamihi, generic word, most generic word in the Bible for healing. Uh, so, and we pick up here, uh, where did I leave off? Verse 7 up and start. For this reason, I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you Say in the word, and my servant will be healed. Again, this picture of humility. For I also, and it's really key here, I also am a man 
placed under authority. See, that's really key there, recognizing Jesus was a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, to one soldier, go and he goes, to another, come and he comes, and to my slave or servant, this is the Greek word doulos, do this and he does it. Well, again, kind of interesting here, these three words, uh, two of them are related to soldiers, go and come, but he changes the, 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 the persons right in the middle of the, of, the, of, the, of the verse, but to my servant I say do. Well, wouldn't you certainly think that the, the, the soldiers would do as well? Uh, but he changes why it's based on what he heard. Now remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the, the rhema word. So things that have been spoken are coming alive on the inside of him, activating his faith, taking him from just an ordinary faith to a place where Jesus says, great faith. Matter of fact, he says, I've not seen this great a faith in all of Israel. So we're going to take a few minutes to look at that, what he heard here. and But he goes on says, so I say to... Uh, Another come and he comes unto my slave, do this, and he doeth it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him, turned him and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not in, in Israel have I found such great faith. When those who had sent had been sent, now remember, who was sent? Elders of the Jews first. Number two, the friends. But when they had returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. We can see clearly here in this story from Luke's account that the, the centurion never left his house. Now, Luke is an interesting gospel, unlike all the other gospels, or what's called synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because Luke was not an eyewitness. Luke is a doctor. He's an historian. He wrote his account uh, based on interviews with other people. He was not there. Luke is the only gospel that we have that is considered chronologically accurate. In other words, the miracles are in, in uh, historical order. They're in the chronological order that they happened. Now, what's interesting is that puts this miracle, depending on whose record you're looking at, somewhere between Miracle 7 and Miracle 10. Now, I'm going to go through with you real quickly uh, the first 10 miracles that Jesus did. And I prefer this list of the miracles that Jesus did. And basically, uh, I believe there's 35 miracles in this list. 36. Again, the, it, it differs based on you know, people's perception on what a miracle is or what a miracle isn't. And some include the, the ascension as a miracle. Uh, some include the miracle, the birth, and their miraculous conception as a miracle. So, you know, anywhere from 35 to 40 miracles, depending which ones you count. And there's some miracles that, that I think are incredible miracles that aren't even listed. Like when uh, Jesus uh, and Peter walked down the water, that obviously is one miracle. But then when Jesus got into the boat, it says, I think it was Matthew's account, the boat was immediately on the other shore. Well, that's a whole other miracle. That, I mean, that Jesus and, and 12, 12 disciples translated from the middle of the sea to the other side. Again, that would be, in my account, another miracle. Also, when Jesus walked through the crowd uh, that wanted to kill him, I mean, to me, that would be another miracle as well. Okay, so let's look at these first miracles. And again, the reason I want to do this is point out to you what the centurion heard. Okay, now I'm looking at my timer. We don't have much time left here for a 30-minute timeline. So I'm just going to highlight these real quickly. First miracle, Jesus made water to wine. Now here's what, remember Mary said to the servants. Remember the, the, the kind of uh, uniqueness here? He said to the soldiers, go. They go. I say, come and they come. And to my servants, do and they do. Well, the very first miracle that Jesus did, Mary said to the servants, whatever he says, do it. Okay? Number two miracle. 
uh, the nobleman's son. And we're going to look at this probably our next time because this is really key because, again, it's what the nobleman's going to say to him that's going to so impact his fate. And the, the, the nobleman, uh, and we see this uh, miracle in John 4, uh, verses 48 to 54, but he came to Jesus in Cana, wanted Jesus to come to Capernaum to heal his son. But what Jesus said is, go thy way, thy son liveth. And it says he believed the word that Jesus spoke. Well, what was, what was the word he spoke? Go thy way. The very first miracle that Jesus, uh, well, the second miracle that Jesus did was done by the spoken word, go. Again, how does faith come? By hearing. The next miracle is the draught of fishes in Luke 5. And what Jesus says there is put out, put out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. And that word say in there, that's the Greek word, it's actually at thy word, and it's the, it's the word rhema again. Uh, but see, at thy word I will do it. Spoken word. At thy word I will obey. The next miracle is the cure of the demoniac. And uh, Jesus, and, and this is actually a key here because again, these are the very first miracles that Jesus did and they are quoted by the centurion. Remember, servant do what he does. First, then, then the nobleman, go thy way. Well, here's the next miracle, and it's in the synagogue the centurion built. In Luke chapter 4, verse 33, to verse 37, and it's there Jesus is confronting a demon-possessed man, and what does he say? Come out of him. See, the very, in, within the first four miracles, we see these three words, go, come, and do. All the first miracles that Jesus did were done by the spoken word. The next miracle is Peter's mother-in-law. We see this in, uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and, but in Luke's account, in verse 439, he rebuked the fever, and it left her spoken word. Now, the other Gospels say he also touched her, but key thing is spoken word. He rebuked the fever. Next miracle, the leper. In, uh, again, we see this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, in Matthew, verse number 3, it says, uh, Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him, saying, I am willing to be cleansed. And at that spoken word, the man was healed. Next miracle, uh, number seven was the paralytic is cured. And we see this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke again. In Matthew 9, it says, Jesus said to the paralytic, take courage, your sons, your sins are forgiven. So by the spoken word, he forgave him. And then going down to verse number six, it says, he said to the paralytic, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. Spoken word, get up, go home. Number eight miracle is the cure of Poseidon. Remember there, the pool of Bethesda? And he goes up to the, the, the man that uh, had, had, had been sick all those years. And what does he say? Pick up your pallet and walk. I'm rushing here because I'm about out of time. That's John 5, verses 8 and 9. So again, pick up. He, Jesus didn't touch the man, didn't lay hands on him. He spoke to him a command which the man obeyed. And then number nine, Miracle is, again, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In Luke's account, chapter 6, and again, you can see here chronologically, all of these miracles that are recorded in Luke are prior to Luke 7 because, again, Luke is in chronological order. But we see in Luke 6.10, after looking around at them, he said uh, to the man that had the withered hand, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was restored. How did the miracle take place? by the spoken word. All the miracles that Jesus did, all the first miracles were done, how? By the spoken word. So what we're going to see as we dig into this is what's going to happen between verse 3 and verse 6 between the elders and the, and the friends is a message is going to come to the centurion that says Jesus will come and lay hands on your servant. Greek word, therapeuo. Jesus said in Matthew, I will come 
and therapy. Well, I will lay hands. Coming from the Greek word therapon, where we get the English word therapy, Jesus says something totally unique. I'm going to come and lay hands. So what happens? The centurion says, oh no, you don't have to come. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. That's the faith God wants you to have. Confidence that you can speak the word and miracle healing power can go from here to anywhere in the universe just like that, faster than the speed of light, simultaneously. That's the authority. That's the power you have as a believer in a matter of time. Hey, I'm confident this ministry is blessing you. This word has blessed you. I'm asking you to pray about being a partner to this ministry. Help us see our vision fulfilled. Over 100 million souls saved, discipled, and serving God. Would you plant the seed today? Would you become a monthly partner? I would really appreciate that. We have a special program we give people that are our partners. They don't have time to talk about it. But we give you our level one supernatural discipleship absolutely free for any level of monthly support. It's not on the website. You have to call and talk to me about that. But pray about being a partner. And whatever you can do, I appreciate it. All the information is on your screen there. You can do it online. You can do it by phone. Uh, you can do it by snail mail. And uh, whatever you can do, very much appreciated. And at the very least, like the ministry. If, if, if it's the message, if it blessed you, subscribe so you get notices of the future. And again, tell somebody, share it with somebody. Amen. Hey, have yourself a great blessed week. We'll look forward to seeing you right back here next Tuesday night. God bless. Boop, boop.